Welcome to Dr. Dr. Archer's lectures. Today we're going to talk about the production possibility curve and how it works. You remember the last time we were together, we were talking about factors of production. We talked about that the factors of production include land, which is all the natural resources within the land, water, minerals, oil, anything that you might find there. Labor includes all the abilities that the humans bring to work. It's the people themselves and all of their abilities. Capital includes all the goods produced for use in further production. It's much more than money. It has to do with equipment and buildings and all those kinds of things. And finally, entrepreneurship, the assembling of these resources to produce new or improved products and technologies. In our last video, we talked about that all of these things all of these things are considered finite. They're scarce. Not scarce in the sense that they're rare. Many times they are not rare, but scarce in the sense that there aren't enough to fill all desired uses. And so when we think about scarcity, then that forces us to make choices. And we talked a little bit about opportunity cost. Opportunity cost, if you'll remember, looks at the choices that weren't taken when we made a choice. So as, as a business, as you think about, we have all these resources, some of all of these things, and these resources are finite. We can't do everything we might want to do. Whatever we use our land for, that means that that land is unavailable for other uses. Whatever we use our labor for, those people are not available for other uses. It's scarce. We have to make choices. And those choices are often represented in what's called a production possibilities curve. The production possibilities curve basically looks at finite resources, a group of finite resources, and usually two possible available uses of the factors of production and production technology. So you have this finite resource and how are you going to use it? Two options. And so it might look something like this. In this example, this, this ec economy can produce either computers or it can produce wheat. Now if it puts all of its resources into producing computers, it can make 500 computers, but there's nothing left to make wheat. If it puts all of its resources into making wheat, it can produce 5,000 tons of wheat, but there's nothing left to make computers. And then these points in between represent kind of all the compromise position. Well, we'll make some computers, that'll give us some wheat, different, different levels. Now keep in mind, Every single one of these points is valid. Every single one of these points represents we used all of our resources and this is what we were able to produce. It, it has to do simply with choices. Does it make more sense for us to use our resources to produce computers, to produce wheat, to produce some combination of the two? And so here's what the production possibilities curve looks like. First of all, you've got two axes. We've got wheat here on the vertical axis, and it starts at zero down here in the corner, 1,000, 2,000, all the way up to 6,000, kind of following what we have here in the, in the chart. And then we have computers going out the horizontal axis in a similar way, going from zero to 600, kind of mirroring or kind of mimicking this chart. So our first point on the production possibilities curve is point A. Point A represents we've put all of our resources into making computers, so we have nothing left with which to make wheat. So wheat production is zero. Wheat is on the vertical axis, so we didn't get any height out of that at all. We're right on this zero horizontal line. But we did get 500 computers. 
So you come over here, one, two, three, four, five, and there's your point A. So let's look at, look at another one, point B. Now we're producing 1,000 bushels of wheat, so we come up to 1,000 on the vertical axis, but now we're only able to produce 400 computers, so we only go one, two, three, four, and there's your point B. You see how this is going, right? Point C, similar. We can produce 2,500 bushels of wheat, so we go up 2,500, but now we can only produce 250 computers, so we only go over 250, and there's our point C. Point D, we're at, at uh, 100 computers, but we're up to 4,000 bushels of wheat. And of course, if we put all of our resources into wheat, we're clear up here, clear up here. So then when you connect these points, you have a production possibilities curve. This particular curve is a straight line. It's a linear curve, and that's because the, the opportunity cost is the same on this curve. Each time we give up a similar, similar opportunity cost, we have a similar opportunity cost. And so when the opportunity cost stays constant, the opportunity cost is represented by the, the slope of the curve, the slope stays constant, and so you have a straight line curve. Keep in mind, if the opportunity cost stays the same, the curve will be linear. That's usually not the case. Let's take a look at another curve. Here's a curve that is nonlinear. This indicates that our, that our opportunity cost changed. When we go from F to A, we give up 800 units. When we go from A to B, we give up 200 un units. We go from B to E, we're giving up uh, over 1,000 units, it looks like. This curve starts out kind of flat and gets more steep as we go along. And we're going to talk about why that's so in a few minutes. But the key takeaway right now is opportunity costs. If the opportunity cost is changing as we go along, then your curve is going to be nonlinear and it's going to look something like this. It's going to be convex. It's going to round outward away from zero. Let's look at this curve a little bit more also. Previously, I was talking about that all the options in that wheat versus computers table, all the options were valid options. They all represent full, complete use of all resources available to the economy. Same way here. All of these points on the production possibilities curve, F, A, B, E, these all represent full, complete use of the available resources. Full, complete use of the available resources, all these points. What about the points that are inside the curve that are closer to zero? Well, if we could be producing at F, A, B, or E, but in fact we're only producing at D, that indicates we're not using all of our resources. How would that happen? Well, a good example is back in 2008 when our unemployment rate was around 10%. We weren't using all of our labor resource. We were well inside the curve like this. So when you see a point that's closer to zero inside the curve, that indicates that we're not using all the resources. So what about C? What's going on out here? If F, A, B, and E all represent full, complete use of all available resources, and C is further away from zero, producing more than those points on the curve, that's just not possible. That's just not possible with the current resources. 
that last phrase is important. It's with the current resources. If we get more resources, then we have more, then the, the production possibilities curve will shift and we'll be able to produce more. When we talk about this curve being convex, being nonlinear, we talked about that it was because the opportunity cost was increasing. Let's think about why the opportunity cost would increase. It's very, very common. It's called the law of increasing opportunity cost. And it just says the more you produce of a particular item, the more, the greater the opportunity cost for each additional unit produced. Why? Because resources tend to be specialized. When we were thinking about in that previous one, cars versus computers, some tools work better for computers, some tools work better for cars. Workers, some workers work better on cars, some workers work better on computers. Equipment, some equipment is well suited for computers, some equipment is well suited for cars. So when you start shifting these resources, well, the obvious thing is, first, you're going to take the resources that are well suited to the shift. And you won't, it won't cost you very much in lost productivity. Those workers can do a good job making cars. We'll move them over first. But as you continue to shift more and more workers, you have to dig deeper. You have to go to your B team and your C team and your D team to keep moving workers over. And these are workers increasingly that they're really good at computers, but not so good at cars. So our opportunity cost is greater. We have to move more workers over in order to get the same amount of increase in productivity. So we lose more of, of the other item. Our opportunity cost is increasing. So that's what makes this, this production possibilities curve nonlinear. What would happen, under what circumstances would we, in fact, be able to produce at level C? We said just a minute ago that C represents a point outside the production possibilities curve. F, A, B, and E are all points on the curve and represent full, complete use of all available resources. C is beyond all available resources. But what if we got more resources? It happens all the time, right? What if we got more workers? What if we got some new, more, more uh, efficient equipment? What if new technology just made it easier to produce things? Well, then what you get is a shift in the production possibilities curve. This is a whole new curve out here. And now we could produce 1,000 cars. But now, instead of only going up to 3,000 computers, we can go to 4,000 computers. More workers, more equipment, it's caused a shift in the production possibilities curve. So any time that you get a change in the total amount of resources, you're going to get a shift in the curve, a shift in the curve. And by the way, the, shift can, the curve can shift inward also. What if our community had been hit by a, a hurricane, as New Orleans was, uh, when, when uh, Hurricane Ike came through? or Katrina rather, Hurricane Katrina came through, then a lot of the infrastructure was destroyed, a lot of the factories were destroyed, then you would have seen this production possibilities curve shift inward. We actually lost resources. So it can shift out or it can shift in, but a shifting curve has to do with changes in the amount of finite resources. That's different from movement from E to B to A to F. Here, we have the same total amount of resources, 
Well, we're just moving them from producing cars to producing computers to producing different levels. We're just running up and down this curve. But all these points, F, A, B, E, they all represent the same amount of total resources and they all represent full and efficient use of all available resources. All of this has to do with the theory that Adam Smith first wrote about in the 1700s. It's called market mechanism. We use market prices and sales to signal, signal to us how to allocate those resources. That's how those decisions are made. We make what people want, and it's a, an interaction of buyers and sellers, each acting in their own self-interest that drives the market in this way. So when we think about computers or cars, we would think about, well, what do people want? Do they want more computers right now? Do they want more cars right now? Where is our opportunity to make the most profit? And that's where we're gonna put our resources. And that's what Adam Smith was talking about when he talked about that invisible hand. As long as there's profit to be made, we will allocate resources in the most efficient way. And that, that takes care of all that decision-making for us. It's all driven by price. So I hope that's been helpful. I hope you understand production possibilities curves better by now. Don't forget, come and see me in virtual office hours, 5 o'clock every day, Monday through Thursday, and 2 o'clock on Friday. And, of course, that's all GCU time. And we can go over individual problems and look at individual um, graphs together if you like. And I look forward to seeing you next time on Dr. Archer's Lectures.